Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast. I am your host, Zach Beach, and I'm here with the incredible leader and relationship coach, Gigi Azmi. Hello, Gigi, and welcome to the show. Hi, Zach. Thanks for having me. Our topic for today is skills for a happy relationship. But before we get into that, let's learn a little bit more about Gigi. For those that don't know, Gigi Asmi is a recognized thought leader and relationship coach based in the San Francisco Bay Area, known for one thing, her ability to rapidly transform her clients' chronic issues into success with laser-like precision. Before her powerful transformational work, she worked for one of the biggest business consulting agencies in the world. She then opened her own tech consultancy and has been designing, managing, and implementing technology solutions for Fortune 500 companies for the past eight years. She helps her clients with a mix of relationship, spiritual, and executive coaching, does personal development workshops and trainings, and has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in business. Hello, Gigi. How are you doing today? Hey, Zach. I'm doing good. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And there's so much I want to talk about today, so much I want to ask you about. But let's just give our listeners a bit of background. How did you transition from tech consulting to relationship coach? And I'm also kind of wondering what skills that you are bringing into from this work of consultancy into your coaching practice. Great question. Yeah, so you definitely see a lot of the old work that you used to have as a coach come into your coaching work. Um, So, you know, like this today, giving a podcast interview is a big part of presenting as a business consultant. So I would present for Fortune 500 companies our new technology solutions. And um, I would be a speaker and I would create uh, presentations and do the writings and the documentations very much like I do today for people to help them understand the process of how to have a healthy relationship. So Mm -hmm. becoming a a coach was really organic in the sense of my personal development journey started when I was around 15, 16 years old. So I was reading books like Castaneda and uh, Tony Robbins and things like that. And um, so that's 15. And when I was starting in the tech industry, um, I was in my late 20s. And as I got, you know, bigger and better at my work in tech and in corporate, uh, people started also seeing, oh, wow, this is the person that we come to to help us with our with our personal stuff, with our issues when we can't collaborate, when we can't work well together, when we're having a hard time at home, Gigi's kind of the person we come to talk to. Mm -hmm. People would ask me, hey, so why don't you do this? uh, for a living? And my best friend asked me to teach with him. We started a group called Urban Awakening, and that's when I really started coming out, was giving these workshops uh, week after week, month after month, and the people in the audience would then come and ask me uh, to do one-on-one sessions with them. Tell me more about this Urban Awakening, this kind of work that you do. So Urban Awakening is a group that meets, and the, the tagline for it is, we're sharing the awakening journey with community. Because when I was growing up as a millennial, And looking in the spiritual world that I was super interested in, I kept seeing these people that were put on pedestals and, uh, you know, the guru figure. And I, I really understood through my own journey that this, this guru figure is a disservice to the people in the crowd because then they start thinking that spirituality is this elevated thing that normal people, average people can't have. 
Mm -hmm. was actually in the sharing of the hardships of the journey, not in the elevated, um, pouring light all over the place, you know, type of space, but in the, yeah, you know, I lost my temper again. Yes, I got frustrated again, you know? Yes, I had road rage again. Yes, I fell back into my addiction again. That's, that's the real spirituality. That's the spirituality, you know, where the rubber hits the road, where you're really meeting life completely in, in deep honesty. So Urban Awakening was a place to share honestly what's going on in your spiritual life instead of just making believe that everything was awesome and you're floating on clouds and walking on water, which is not true. Just have not found that. Um, and being a student and then also a close friend with many of many spiritual teachers and many spiritual teachers that became well known, I really saw the person that they were behind closed doors. I really saw the human. I saw the, you know, all of them struggled in some way with something in their life, whether it was their health or their relationships or financially or their, you know, there was a big struggle in everyone's life. And for some reason, when people come out to teach, they don't share that struggle very readily because the the audience ex does unfortunately also expect this level of perfection so we're trying to break that mold yeah that reminds me of the robert masters book on spiritual bypassing one of the ways that people do spiritual bypass is through what he calls anti-negativity this idea that anything that's negative is bad. So if you come to somebody and they're trying to be a little bit spiritual and you tell them that you're having a hard time, they'll reply with, well, everything happens for a reason, or just be the love and the light that you are. And it totally just ignores this other aspect of our human experience. So I really enjoyed your sort of appraisal or almost critique of a common phenomenon that we see in spiritual communities. And it ties directly into the work that you're doing with couples and relationships and the people that you work with in sort of being able to identify an area of growth and what it is that a person needs. So let's go right into today's topic of happiness. So when you work with people or when you work with couples, what do you think is stopping people from being happy in their relationship? Yeah, Zach. So I was one of those people that was chronically unhappy in her relationships. Okay. And I wish I could say it was because I wasn't smart or I wasn't this or I wasn't that. But the, the truth was, you know, as you read from my bio, I'm a strong woman. I grew up in the inner cities of New Jersey. At 18 years old, I ran away from home with $20 in my pocket. Four weeks later, I got a full scholarship to one of the top 50 schools in the country. I made a career for myself in New York City leading tech projects for Fortune 500 companies. So I would consider myself a smart woman. I got my master's in business, worked for one of the top consulting companies in the world. My personal development and spiritual journey started at 16. So I was tough. I was smart. I was spiritually connected. And I would never at 18 years old think that I would get into an abusive relationship. I was um. definitely one of those young women. Yeah, that was like, I will never be one of those women. I will never be one of those women. Until I kept getting into narcissistic or bipolar or emotionally abusive relationships where I never got my needs met and my partners never went to counseling for help no matter how much I begged. 10 years after this consistently, perpetually failed unhappy relationships, I had to ask myself, what is so broken inside of me that I keep on attracting broken relationships? And once I was able to understand and heal that part of me, I was able to attract my soulmate, who's now my husband. So what stops people from having happy relationships? They don't know. They just don't know or they, they're not connected to enough or clear enough about what keeps creating a toxic relationship for them. I could have blamed all of my boyfriends for my bad relationships. Believe me, I could have. I had like a, a rap sheet of a thousand things they did wrong. But guess who was attracted to them in the first place? Right. Me. The work starts with me no longer being attracted to unhealthy relationship dynamics. 
that's an amazing personal story and I want to I want to actually if you don't mind hear more about it because when you talk to a lot of people who are having struggles in their relationships they do sort of uh replicate this repeating pattern that you're talking about you might talk to somebody and they say oh you know all girls are just crazy like i mean all these crazy people or you talk to somebody else and they say oh guys are just jerks everyone i meet is just a total jerk and that generalization, you know, brings a lot of questions. It's like, well, is it true? Are all these people crazy and jerks? Or are you attracting and bringing these people into your life? So first question I have, and if you don't want to get too personal, you know, feel free, we can shift. But I'm wondering what the beginning like wake up call was. So after a series of toxic relationships, at what point were you just fed up? Or were you just realizing that this pattern is not serving you? It was that last that last time that I did it, meaning the last time that I, allow, I allowed myself to get into a toxic relationship again. So in, in the beginning, just like everyone else, you don't know it's a toxic relationship. This person seems extremely charming. You're having a great time together. And then you start seeing the first patterns. And when I started seeing the first patterns, I saw how I made excuses for those patterns. And I kept on going and I had this incredible heartbreak at the end because we had told our parents that we were actually getting engaged and we were going to fly cross country to see them and, and do the whole thing. And two weeks in, we're breaking up Wow! over the, the very thing that was a problem, the very first problem that I ever saw with him. So there was no denying that I saw issues immediately. I ignored issues. I numbed out what I was feeling and I kept on going. And at that point, for some reason, I don't know why, but it was, it was at that point where I said, okay, I can't ever do this again. Now, it's not, it's not the first time I ever said that to myself. You know, but it really was again, um, Zach, it was what is so broken inside of me that that this strong, smart, spiritual woman who was extremely interested in personal development since she was 16 was still at 30 years old breaking up out of a relationship where she thought she was going to get married to this person and it was a toxic relationship. So you had this realization, you're looking at yourself, you know, it's, it almost sounds like what a lot of people are calling them the quarter life crisis. And what was your path of healing? That's incredible question, Zach, because my path of healing actually become became my teachings in the end, you know, for people with relationships. And it became the course that I was telling you about before this uh, recording, which is called Becoming the One. How do you become the one for yourself? So I had to learn how to become the one for Gigi. So first it was, what, how am I so broken, right? That I keep attracting this. And one of the things that I found inside of myself is that I keep putting love outside of me. Mm. If I really, really, really like you and I have a super duper crush on you and and you're texting me and then today for some reason you don't text me and you don't text me all day long, I might be really, really sad inside and I might think, oh no, I don't think he likes me anymore. And then I might create a story like, oh, it might have been that, th that last text I sent him. It must be because I said this. Mm -hmm. And then I blame myself, right? And then I maybe I bend over backwards a little bit to be more entertaining or cool or whatever to get the attention that I want or to get the feeling that I'm not being rejected and abandoned in this moment. Does that strike a bell? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love, I just want to repeat what you said because it was so beautiful that you kept putting love outside of you. That's right. I kept sourcing love outside of myself. So if I didn't get that text message back and it was all day long and hour after hour, that anxiety inside of me of, oh my, why hasn't he texted yet grows? That's me putting love outside of myself. And you think that looking for love outside of yourself was what brought you into these negative relationships because you wanted somebody else to kind of solve all the problems in your life. It doesn't seem like that when we're in it. Mm -hmm. Here's what I would notice. He would do something that was not okay. 
and I would glaze over it. I would excuse it. And then you mentioned finding the source of love inside. So tell our listeners more about that. How did you find this source of love that was inside? How did you become your own one? Okay, man. So I want you to I want you to just really, really listen to this and tell me if there's any like anything here that you feel you can help me clarify because this is extremely important what i'm about to say okay okay the lie that we kept getting told which is it's not a lie to mess us up it's just a misunderstanding so i'll I'll change what i'm saying here so the misunderstanding that we keep getting told is you have to love yourself when you're traumatized When you've had a lot of brokenness in your childhood, it's really hard to know how to love yourself. Even if you didn't have the brokenness, there's a sense of like, what does that even mean to love myself? And the deeper truth that I found is you don't find ways to love yourself more. You find the love that is already inside of yourself. So we all have love inside of ourselves. I'm not talking about Zach's love for himself. I'm talking about does Zach inherently in his heart have a spark of love that's just inherently there? It reminds me of the Rumi quote, which you have also probably heard, which is that your task is not to seek for love, but merely to remove all the obstacles against it. Absolutely. That's, that's it right there. So if I start finding, and right now we can do it right now together. In the, if you close your eyes, and it's so much better if you close your eyes. So if you close your eyes and for a second, you just feel any shred of love that you have in your heart. Oh, that shred of love that you feel when you see a child walk by. The shred of love that you feel when you see someone's grandmother giving them a kiss on the cheek, the shred of love that you feel when you see a puppy or a kitten, any shred of love that you might have for a niece or a nephew, anything that you love at all, and feeling that love, that little, little tiny bit of love in your heart, and feeling that love expand, using your imagination and having that love expand and feel it fill every cell and bone of your body. Allow that tiny dot in the heart to expand into a you know size of a grapefruit and then size of a basketball. And let it expand into your entire body until it goes down your arms and down your legs. And feel that love is not something that is outside of me. Love is something that is already always here always here so if I have a practice where I come back to that love where I ask myself you know that love that I think I want over there is that love not already in here that's a question for for a true spiritual master if any of your listeners are really trying to get into deep mastery is is that love that I want over there not already inside of me and then amplifying and magnifying that love within oneself so that that tendency to grasp for love outside of yourself or that tendency to be afraid of love and push it away you need not do either anymore you can feel the love that is already inherently within you so you're not constantly addicted to grabbing for it or pushing it away because you're afraid of it First off, wow, I just feel just tingles right now in my body and feeling just a lightness right in the center of my chest with that short meditation. So thank you for that. And I'm glad that you brought in this element of spirituality and this idea of spiritual love, because when you do look at the teachings of a lot of spiritual teachers, somebody like Osho, somebody like Muji, they'll often describe like the metaphor of falling in love as the parting of clouds. 
And a lot of times we attribute the love that we feel like to the clouds or to this external person. But in that parting, it's the natural love that we have was allowed to shine. For a lot of people, they stop at that point. Like the clouds part a little bit and they feel a little light and a little love. And then they think that this is it. But that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of the vast and expansive blue sky that, of unconditional love that we can find within all of us. Well said. Yes, beautifully said. So you found this source of love. You became your own one. And you got married. (laughs) I wish I could say it was that easy, Zach. So I spent three years before I met my husband in a space where I was consciously doing my inner work, you know, because people come in and after a session, they're like, okay, yeah, you think I'll meet my soulmate now? And I'm like, wow, after one session, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I took three years where I really, really sat with that question and really looked into, can I, sourcing love outside of myself was not a simple thing to stop, you know, because that's an addiction, right? You like someone, you want them to hang out with you, you want them to do all the things with you. You know, you you want a certain reaction from them. You want them to be a certain way for you. And so that that reaction, as much as I intellectually and spiritually understood, it had to be practiced until it became second nature. And then I had to understand another layer of deep understanding was understanding sacred masculine and feminine work. Mm-hmm. That was a really big layer of it, was really understanding because I have a very strong masculine understanding how to balance both my masculine and my feminine so that I could be very attractive to my partner in the most genuine way, you know, and we could talk about that later. Um, Another part of it was also learning how to work with the law of attraction in manifesting my partner. So it, I was a teacher, I was a consultant, I'm out there in the world with a lot of men and there wasn't one man in my life that I could say, wow, he's definitely a representative of the man that I wanna be with one day. So I had no evidence in my outside world that the man that I wanted who was deeply spiritual, deeply uh, loving, deeply business savvy, deeply grounded existed, you know? Mm, mm-hmm. I had to use, I had to really understand deeply the right way to use the law of attraction (laughs) to, to call that in. So there were many things at play here. You know, there's trauma work, there's manifestation work, there's understanding sacred masculine and feminine work. And there's also that deep, you know, faith because when nothing is working and your parents are screaming at you for getting too old and you're not on a dating site and your friends think that you're just afraid of love, there has to be something that holds your vision to say, no, what I want is is beautiful and okay and I can have that without doing all the things that people think that I should be doing. It's such a wonderful path that you have gone on and I very much appreciate you sharing it with me and sharing it with our listeners And what comes to mind is this idea of becoming conscious, this idea of becoming aware, is for a long time, it seems like you were guided by unconscious patterning that was propelling you from one toxic relationship to another. And you became conscious of all of these dynamics that were at play, as well as a whole world of possibility and also sort of paths to walk on from the law of attraction, from understanding these dynamics. So let's shift a little bit from your own personal experience to the work that you do, because you do describe yourself as a conscious relationship coach. So to you, from your perspective, what does it mean to be in a conscious relationship? Oh, wow. To be in a conscious relationship is to be in a relationship where people are taking their personal growth seriously. Mm -hmm. This means that they're also looking at what is so broken or out of alignment within themselves that they might lose their temper or get frustrated or jealous or impatient or push their partner away. What is the story in the moment that they might be telling themselves? Because a conscious relationship to me is people who care about those answers. And what they care about even more than the answers is the actions 
that actually work on those answers because knowing isn't enough. They become the change that they want to see in the world in action. Right? I wanted that relationship my entire life, but I wasn't able to have it without healing my personal wounds and stopping the trauma bonding. Wow. Yeah. That totally makes a lot of sense. This idea that in a conscious relationship, both partners in the relationship are focused on their own individual growth, own individual healing. They're on their own path towards an open heart. And so I'm wondering how do they meet? Not like meet in the world, but in terms of I'm working on my path and you're working on your path. How can we meet in relationship in the like best possible way? Okay, so here's what people aren't doing. They come to me all the time and they tell me, "I've Gigi, I've done so much work." And then I and then I check with them and I check on what the problems are and what their problems are showing me, Zach, is that they're not listening to their mind. They're not being mindful of what they're thinking in the moment. So to work on yourself is to be able to be mindful of what you're even thinking about, right? So I'll give you an example of a client named Anna. So Anna sends her boyfriend a text that she wasn't able to sleep all night. And he comes in to hang out with her later. And he was excited to show her um, some new gadget that he had bought. And he was talking to her about that. And inside of herself, she was feeling frustrated that he wasn't reacting to her not being able to sleep or the bad night that she had, right? Like she thought he should be reacting in a different way. He should be putting his attention on her. He should be bringing up the bad night of sleep that she had. And so what she does is she switches the conversation then to talk about herself again and then brings up her bad night of sleep all over again and makes it sound even worse, okay? This is a a couple who thinks that they're conscious, but they're not really being with what they're thinking. So when she started to pause with her thinking, really pause with it, she found, okay, you're not reacting the way that I want you to. And what she found inside of herself, right, is this, uh, I call it the should monster. You should be doing it like this. So if she was mindful, step one, being absolutely mindful of what you're thinking, she's thinking, I want your attention. She's understanding that the story she's telling herself is that he should be reacting a different way than he is right now. Mm -hmm. Then she has to ask herself, is it true Is it true that he should be reacting the way that I want him to? Well, the truth is it would be nice if he did, wouldn't it? Right. But he can't react in a certain way that she wants him to react all the time because how would she like it if he got to determine every single way she reacted to one of his text messages? She would go absolutely crazy. (laughs) (laughs) So... She has to understand then that the story of suffering, the story of struggle, the story of pain that she's creating that's ripping her relationship apart in this moment is, I can't feel better unless you react the way that I want you to. So if she's not going to be mindful of the story and be able to talk herself down from the level of story to the level of truth. Now, what's the truth? The truth is that her boyfriend is allowed to have the reaction that he's having in that moment because his reaction isn't abusive in any way whatsoever. He just came in and he was excited to show her his new gadget, right? So once she started, once Anna started to understand how to work with her emotions in this way, how to become mindful of what she's thinking, how to really look into the story that her mind is believing and how to talk herself out of the story and into the truth, her boyfriend proposed to her in it literally a matter of months. Wow. I love that. I just want to repeat this, this idea that you keep saying, which is we drop from the level of story to the level of truth. 
And it's the story that I feel like turns into that sort of judgment and criticism, which is what I'm hearing from this story, is that she wasn't in her truth and had gotten caught up in this story that her boyfriend doesn't care, that uh, he's very insensitive. And as a result, there's judgment, there's criticism and conflict. And the truth here sounds like a feeling of loneliness and disconnect. Or when we drop from story to truth, what would we say or what would you say the truth is? The truth is that he innocently walked in there excited to show her something. And the truth is that she wants his attention And the truth is that she's not naming her need in this moment. Instead of naming her need, which means just telling the truth about her need, she ends up embellishing her story and making it sound more dramatic than it has to be to get the attention that she wants. Mm. So now he doesn't have a safe space to just be himself. And she doesn't, she is not allowing herself to have a safe space to just tell, share what she feels so that she can create a safe space for herself. That reminds me of this idea that we call desire smuggling, where oftentimes we want something and either we don't ask for it or we don't even know that we want it. So then we sort of smuggle like that request in like a different alternative way. So in this case, she is expressing like this challenging night that she had because she wants uh, to be listened to. She wants to be heard. She wants that support, but she's not saying those things. So then it elevates and elevates. And what I'm hearing from you is we have to get to that desire, to that need, and to express it in kind of an open and non-judgmental way. That's right. But one of the big hurdles that Anna had to work with me on, Zach, is she had a story that if I sent you this text about my day, then you should react to it in a certain way. And if you don't react to it in a certain way, then that means that you don't really care about me. And that's the real problem here. So this is where I'm talking about these big wounds, these big trauma wounds, because she didn't feel seen by her mother in childhood. So when someone now as an adult makes her feel like she's not being seen or they're not reacting exactly in the way that makes her feel seen, then she, then the criticism monster comes on inside of her and the criticism monster comes on and it says, you don't care about me. So if you don't care about me, I'm going to make this more dramatic and I'm going to tell you a bigger story until you care about me. I'm I'm almost going to manipulate and force you into caring about me, which doesn't make her feel good. It makes her feel terrible. So she started honing in on that feeling in her body that goes, this doesn't feel good. So if this doesn't feel good, then I must be thinking a thought that isn't true. What's the thought that I'm thinking that isn't true? He's He's not bringing it up and that means he doesn't care about me. Okay, great. Is that true? And this is, the, this is the big trauma wound here is that it feels so true that she had to do quite a bit of work to know that that isn't true. It isn't true that just because he's not having the reaction that she's looking for, that it, that it means that he doesn't care about her. And that was really where the work was. That's the trauma bonding. That leads me directly into the next subject we wanted to get into today. Because what was coming up for me is this was question of, well, where is the story coming from? Like, why do we d- generate these stories? Because obviously we want to be happy and we want to love our partner and we don't want to wake up the criticism monster, which I love, by the way. I love that imagery of waking up the criticism monster. And, you know, everyone probably listening to this podcast wants to be happy in their relationships and they don't want to judge and, and be stuck in this story. So you touched on it a little bit about where the story comes from in terms of the sort of unconscious understandings that we gained as a young child. And you mentioned this word trauma bonding. So let's just get right into that. What would you say is trauma bonding? What is trauma bonding? Yes. Okay. So trauma bonding is when I fall in love with you because you strike the deep the deepest wound inside of me that I'm not even willing to look at. I fall in love with you because you strike my deepest wound. That I might not even be aware of. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we interpret familiar behavior as intense attraction or chemistry. So 
another client of mine, you know, Deepa, Harvard educated, tells me that she meets this man and immediately the chemistry was just undeniable. She says to me, I've never felt this way about anyone. I never had this amount of connection with someone. And here she is, one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. Again, Harvard educated, uh, just absolutely stunning. But her dad was completely emotionally unavailable to her. Okay. So this man that she met who had all of this chemistry with was also completely emotionally unavailable to her. And her story was, I don't like him because he's emotionally unavailable. I like him because of all the chemistry that we've had. Mind you, they've hung out twice. Mm -hmm. So this this patterning that she has and she's she looks me in the eye and she goes but Gigi I know my worth (laughs) (laughs) you think you know your worth Deepa from Harvard you think you know your worth you think you know your worth but the fact that this man never really shows up for you not consistently not not in a way at all where he's telling you that he's committed in any sense of the word and you have not been able to let go of this relationship for six months and more, you cannot look me in the eye and tell me that you know your worth. Are you going to be more interested in your in the story that you want to hold on to? Or are you going to be more interested in the truth? Because if you're going to be more interested in the story that you want to hold on to, kiss good relationships goodbye. Kiss happy relationships goodbye. It's all about get like really putting up your sleeves and getting in the dirt of... What is the truth? Is it is the truth like Deepa from Harvard here that um, my dad was emotionally unavailable and this man, as much as I'm attracted to him and as hot as he is and as sexy as he is and as much as we have connection and chemistry, what I'm really, really attracted to, unfortunately, is how he's unavailable to me because that's what I'm used to. That's the truth. But what Deepa wanted to hold on to was the connection and the chemistry and the, you know, the, the stuff that makes it feel delicious, the stuff that makes you want to hold on. So what are, what are these signs of trauma bonding is we interpret familiar behavior as intense interaction or chemistry. Mm-hmm. We fear abandonment and rejection. We have a lack of boundaries of space and clear autonomy. Or we have this emotionally addictive cycle of being abandoned and rejected and then chosen again. How many, how many people might you have met that were just waiting for the guy or the girl to call them back, you know? So another client of mine, you know, sweet David, he was captain of the football team, but his father had abandoned him since he was a, a, a boy, a little boy. And as much as, as David did, dad didn't care. Dad was in his life, but he was hardly ever there. And so when David went out dating in his world, he would always choose these women that would be like, yeah, David, I like you, but I, I, I'm not ready to be in a relationship right now. Are you, are you willing to wait for me? Mm. David was fulfilling the same cycle he had with his dad, which is, no, son, I can't be there for you as amazing as you are. Maybe dad will come back. Maybe he'll come back. Maybe he'll choose me again. And he kept playing that same thing out with the women that he was with. Another type of trauma bonding is, you know, being secretive and hiding your behaviors. Another one is intense focus on sexual connection rather than authentic connection. Um, Some other ones are denying or hiding harmful behavior that might be alarming to those around you. And last but not least is a a feeling of chronic self-doubt about yourself and your reality. So first of all, these are some incredible stories that you're sharing with our listeners and with me. So I hope you are working on your next book right now (laughs) because it's incredibly entertaining and it's also very just informative to hear other people's experiences and to realize that in whatever struggles we're going through in our own love life, that we're not alone. Yes, we're not. We're so not alone. I mean, everyone around you is hurting. Everyone around you is hurting. And if they, the, the more confident and unaffected they seem to be, the more hurting they probably are. 
And then at the end of your book, I hope you have an appendix that says these are the behaviors that we associate with trauma bonding because I'm going to need to re-listen to this podcast and write them all down. Can I share some of these behaviors quickly with you? I think this is like super important, but you tell me. Well, we don't have we don't. I don't have so much time in the day and so much time in the podcast because, you know, we have chronic self-doubt, denying harmful behavior. Maybe you can set, write the whole list down. We can put it in the show notes or I can put a link to your website because we can talk about the behavior of trauma bonding all day, but we also need to heal from it. So let's move a little bit forward in terms of what are we going to do about all this behavior? Wow, what are we gonna do with all of these behaviors? So, do you remember the um, the criticism monster I was telling you about? How could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> so, just like the criticism monster, right? Are you aware of the thought of criticism that came up inside of your head? So, if you're aware of the thought, then you have a chance. You actually have a chance to ask yourself. Is this thought, is this criticism at the level of story or at the level of truth? Is this really true what I'm thinking right now? Okay. And if you have that ability to go down into the level of truth, then you can make another choice. If it's not true, I can choose the best version of myself. I could choose to be in my higher self, which does not choose to be in criticism. What you want to become aware of are... How are your wounds coming up inside of you and driving you? So here are some other monsters that you want to think about. There's the fear of rejection and abandonment monster. And this monster makes it so that you hold on to relationships that you're, are not good for you or not healthy for you because you're afraid of being rejected and abandoned. And yet at the same time, what you find yourself doing sometimes is that you're constantly pushing people away because you're afraid of being rejected and abandoned. Another one is the knight in shining armor wound. So the knight in shining armor wound is the part of you that's always shows up as the fixer and the supporter in the relationship. Mm. You're always going to help. You're always going to solve the problems and you kind of burn yourself out. And at the end, you just feel like you're not appreciated. Another wound that comes up, just like remember Anna, where she just didn't feel like she was, her text message was completely replied to, or he didn't, um, you know, act in the way that she wanted her to act. So she was suffering from the, you, you don't see me monster. You don't appreciate me monster. Mm -hmm. So check out that part of you, because I can't tell you how many people, Zach, have that part. It's like, if you don't see me or appreciate me exactly the way that I am hoping to, then I will find a way to slam you, okay? Then there's the excuses monster, right? Like all the excuses that you make about someone else's bad behavior. This is a huge wound that we have. Are you allowing yourself to look at the truth, the shame monster comes in and it tells you that you're broken, you're damaged, there's something wrong with you. So you've got to really check that one out. That is the one that really drives a wedge inside of your relationship. And when the shame monster comes up, it's the, it's the big brother of the criticism monster. So you're going to find a way to really nitpick at your partner, nitpick, nitpick, nitpick until you push them away. It's an incredible strategy. So you've got to really sit with that strategy. Am I doing this to push you away or am I doing this because I truly feel that there's something wrong here? That's the level of truth again, coming down to it. So there's so many different ones of these, but these are just a few ones where you become really, really careful of what is that wounding inside of me? Another one that comes up a lot for people, Zach, is the punisher the punishing monster, which is you screwed up. So I have every right to punish you. You should pay for it. You should know that you're wrong. You should admit that you're wrong. And if you don't, then I'll never talk to you again, or I'll never make up with you, or um, I'll just sit here and sulk. <laughs> that one, that one blows my mind, you know? Right. You know, you remind me a little bit of the spiritual teacher Ram Das for two reasons. One is Ram Das was this big meditator and he called himself the connoisseur of his neurosis. 
<laughs> or his neuroses. And I feel like you're like the connoisseur of people's relationship neuroses. Like you've really nailed down and got into all these monsters that can become awakened uh, in in the relationships. And you also bring that level of both awareness of the dynamics at play and your ability to really summarize it and in a concise way way for people to understand. So my next question is, okay, how are we going to tame all these monsters? Zach, I'm going to share this story because I honestly, from the bottom of my heart, feel people will understand it so much better through the story. So how do we tame these monsters? So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a story of a couple that did it, you know, let's just say for now the wrong way and how to do it the right way. Okay. Okay. So the wrong way is, and, and here's the story of Ang- <laughs> Andrea and Donovan. So Andrea is listening to a relationship podcast. Their relationship isn't doing so well. Donovan is sleeping. Andrea listens to something on the podcast that gets her very excited and she thinks it could really help her relationship. And she goes and in her excitement, she wakes him up and she says, hey, would you uh, take a listen to this real quick? I think it's going to really help us. And he says no. And she goes back to the kitchen and hangs out by herself. He wakes up about an hour later and he goes into the kitchen and he says hello. And she goes, hey, oh my God, you're up. Uh, Do you want to take a listen now? And he says no. And he looks at her face and she looks disappointed. And he gets angry at her. That's the unconscious way to do it, okay? Now, here is what happens when you do it consciously. When you do it consciously, it's she is excited to share something, but she realizes inside of herself that this part of her that wants to share this podcast is going to break a boundary because he's sleeping. So she really checks in, what is, what, why am I so excited? And she can find that part of herself that goes, well, Andrea, if he listens to this podcast and he really gets it, then we can fix our relationship. And if we fix our relationship, then I won't feel rejected and abandoned if we need, then we won't need to break up in the future because that's what she's afraid of. If she was able to be mindful with what she was feeling and thinking, then she would know that her actions aren't motivated really from love. Her actions are motivated from fear. Her actions are motivated to fix and help and support and be the, nine, the that knight in shining armor monster in the relationship. And she goes and she, she wakes him up. And of course, it's going to be a bit upsetting for someone. So she, in that way, she's recognizing that what she wants to do, which seems like it's harmless, is really motivated from her fear. And she stops herself. Now, in, in, his, in his way, say the same thing would have happened, but if he would have gotten up now and saw the look of disappointment on her face, and he was doing it in a conscious way, he would have been able to see that what was really making him upset wasn't the disappointed look on her face. It was the story that he was telling himself. And the story that he was telling himself about the disappointed look on her face was, you're not good enough for her. She's mad at you. You didn't do it right. There's something wrong with you. You're broken. Mm. That's really what was making him angry, not the look on her face. So once Andrea and Donovan did their healing work, Andrea was able to have her reactions without Donovan going into that aggressive space of getting angry because really what she was hitting on was, I'm not enough. There's something wrong with me. And if she's disappointed, then it proves that there's something wrong with me. So here again is this thing that I'm talking about, about are you mindful of what you're thinking? And then when you're mindful of what you're thinking, are you able to tell what the most painful thoughts that you're thinking are, right? Such as I'm broken, I'm not good enough, I'm going to be rejected and abandoned. And then can you tell, can you, can you work within yourself to understand is what you're thinking even true? 
can you rewire the normal response that you usually have, whether it's the knight in shining armor or the fear of rejection and abandonment or the shame monster or, or the one who, who tries to come in and fix everything all the time. So that's how you do it. It's this incredible level of vigilance and mindfulness. It reminds me of this concept we have in meditation circles of taking the sacred pause, being able to, in any relationship, to pause when you find yourself having an emotional reaction in order to respond to the situation at hand with an open and present heart. That's absolutely perfect, yes. And I could just listen to you tell stories all day, Gigi. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, for today. So if people want to learn more about you, people want to work with you, people want to follow you, uh, people want to stay in touch with when your book is going to come out on the monsters in relationships and the stories that we tell each other. Nice. I love it. Um, uh, what are, where, where should people go? They should go to ggazmy.com, G-I-G-I-A-Z-M-Y.com. And um, from there, you, you'll be able to find my Facebook and my YouTube pages. Thank you so much, Gigi. Thank you for coming on the show. This was so much fun, Zach. Absolutely. I hope we get to do it again. You're so wise, and I love all your stories and insight. Thank you. And so, and thank, so thank you for coming on the show, and thank you, listeners, for tuning in this week. We hope you also enjoyed the show. We hope you also learned to tame the monsters in your life and to drop out of the story and find your own authentic truth. To learn more about the podcast, you can go to zachbeach.com or theheartcenter.com. Keep your heart open and keep discovering your own truth. Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, head over to zachbeach.com or theheartcenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.